Hello, everyone. Welcome to the very first edition of Learning the NBA Salary Cap with Hoopstock. That's me, Eric Brandt. Now, I know these videos aren't going to be for everyone, but if you are interested in learning more about how the NBA's collective bargaining agreement works and want to become a more knowledgeable fan in terms of the CBA, I hope you get something out of these videos and enjoy them. The topic for today's video is cap holds. Now, cap holds are a very important part of every team's off-season. Every team starts with cap holds, and basically what cap holds are are a placeholder for things that will count against your salary cap number for the off-season. Now, they do count for the entire year if they don't go away, but in terms of the importance of cap holds, they're mostly only important during the off-season. A team's total salary is not just as easy as adding up the contracts they have and subtracting that number from the salary cap number for the NBA that year. So every team has these holds, like I said, against the cap, and that's how they determine how much cap space they have. It's important to note that these are just holds against your salary cap, so they don't actually count as salary, so when you're trying to figure out things like the luxury tax payment and things like that, a cap hold wouldn't apply to that. This is only for figuring out how much cap space you have or if you have any at all. The very first cap hold we need to talk about is free agents. Every team's free agents that offseason will carry a cap hold with them into the offseason. Now this cap hold will stay with that team until that player is either renounced by that team so you basically give up the rights to re-sign them. Now you can still re-sign that player if you have cap space or another exception to do so, but the avenues for doing so become less um, if you do it that route. Now, the second way you can get rid of a cap hold is if you re-sign that player, in which case the new contract just takes over for the amount of the cap hold and the salary for the new contract would count against the cap instead of the cap hold. And then the third way is if a player signs with another team, then that cap hold obviously disappears from your books and the new contract goes on to their new team and counts against their cap. Included in the free agents for cap holds would also be any players you have offered a qualifying offer to. Now it's not just simple as using that qualifying offer as their cap hold, as many times the player's cap hold is different than the qualifying offer that you offer them. This would only apply, obviously, to people coming off their rookie contracts, but we'll get into more of those specifics later as well. The second cap hold is going to be first round draft picks. Going into this offseason, any first round picks from the 2022 NBA draft will then count as a cap hold until they are signed. Now, there's a rookie scale in the NBA, so all these numbers have already been determined or will be determined. And so there's a set number for each pick. So if you have like the 10th pick, it's $3 million. So it's already known what it's going to be. And then they're going to sign for that same amount. So it doesn't really matter what they sign for or if they've been signed or not in terms of how much cap space you have, because it's either gonna count as a contract that they signed or it's going to count as a cap hold. Either way, it's the same amount for almost all cases of first round picks. It also counts as a cap hold for any unsigned first round picks you have from previous years. So let's say you had a draft and stash player that didn't play for a couple years. Doesn't matter how long ago it was until you renounce the rights to have that player on your roster or he signs with you that carries a cap hold into each off season until something is resolved there. Either they sign with you or you move on from having the rights to them. Second round picks do not actually count as a cap hold. The reason for that is most of the time, second round picks either sign for the minimum or for slightly more than the minimum. So the NBA just views that as a minimum contract. Once you sign a second round pick, then it becomes the contract just like a normal contract would, and it would count towards your cap. But until that point, second round picks do not have any sort of cap hold designation. The next thing that counts as a cap hold are trade exceptions. So if you made any unbalanced trades where you sent out more money than you took in, in in trades in the previous year and have not used them yet, those count as a hold against your salary cap. For example, the salary cap this summer is going to be 122 million. If you had 110 million in salary, but you had a $20 million trade exception, you are not actually under the cap. You actually have 130 million towards the cap. So trade exceptions have to be renounced in order to get cap space to sign free agents without an exception. So 
if you're trying to maximize the amount of cap space you have and have a bunch of trade exceptions, it might not be wise to renounce all those trade exceptions and lose the flexibility of having those just to get cap space that might be a similar amount or in some cases less amount than the trade exceptions would be. The next cap hold will be the mid-level exception and the biannual exception. Now, some teams will be so far over the cap already that they don't get the full mid-level exception, or they might have used the biannual exception the previous year. You only get it once every other year, hence biannual. Some teams might automatically then not have it, but it gets added to every year. So even if you're like 50 million under the cap, you'd still have a cap hold for the mid-level exception until you choose to use cap space instead of that mid-level exception. The last cap hold we need to talk about is free roster spots. So this means any roster spot that's unaccounted for under 12 players counts as a minimum contract roster hold against your salary cap. Now, this includes players that are under contract, players that you have kept the rights to resign, so free agents that you have not renounced, any unsigned first round picks, any players you've offered a qualifying offer to, all those players count towards this number. So let's say you have 10 of those players, for example. That means that you would have two minimum contract roster spots against your cap. Now, if you signed a player for another team and that number went up to 11, then you would only have one roster spot hold. If you had a free agent that you had the rights to and then they signed with another team that would mean that you were down to nine and you would add a roster spot hold so now you would have three roster spot holds so the holds for this can be very fluid and can change depending on what happens in free agency you know it's crazy all these people are signing and stuff like that so it can change from minute to minute during some of the times of the off season how many roster spot holds you have the best way i can explain roster spot holds is if there was a scenario where every team had every single player as a free agent and had no one under contract and no draft picks or anything like that, and then they just renounced all their free agents, they wouldn't just have the $122 million that the cap is in salary cap. They would actually have a minimum contract hold for 12 players. So it's slightly lower than a million dollars, but let's just estimate it as at a million dollars to make it easy. So they would actually have... 12 million against their cap, even in a scenario where they had absolutely no one against the cap. So really the most cap space a team could theoretically get right off the bat would be like 110 million against 122 million salary cap. All right, so those are what the cap holds are, but now we need to figure out how those cap holds are determined. And to do that, you gotta know that there's three different types of free agents. There's ones with full bird rights, early bird rights, and non-bird rights. And we'll get into this in another video. That's another topic that'll be a specific focus for another one of these learning the salary cap videos. For now, just basically think of it this way. If a player has been on a three or four year contract or five year contract and got traded to your team or has been with your team for more than three years, they usually have bold bird rights, in which case you can resign them to any amount between a minimum and a maximum contract, go over the cap to do so, and all that kind of stuff. If they have early bird rights, it means that they've been on a two-year contract, whether it was traded to you as a two-year contract or they've been on your team for two years, in which case you have a little bit of leeway to sign them to a certain percentage of their contract or to re-sign them for the average salary amount in the NBA. Now, the average salary amount is another number that's important. It's not really important what it is right now. Just know that there's a certain average salary amount. And the early bird rights is usually more than that amount. And then uh, for cap holds, it just matters if you're above or below that amount for determining what the cap hold is. And then non-bird rights would just be players that have been with the team for one year on a one-year contract. And you don't really have the rights to resign them to any amount like you would with a full bird rights player. So with a full bird right free agent, their cap hold would be 150% of their contract. So let's just say a player made $20 million on their contract. That would mean that their cap hold for that offseason would be 30 million. Now, the only <laughs> exceptions to this are 
it can't be any lower than the minimum. So if it is lower than the minimum, it would just be the minimum contract. It can't be any more than the maximum. So let's say in this case of the $20 million player, let's say his maximum contract was 29 million, then the 29 million would be his cap number instead of 30. But just in general, it's 150% of that number up to the maximum contract. If they make less than the average salary, it's going to be 190% of the contract. So let's say a player made 5 million last year. So going into that next off season, they would count against your cap for nine and a half million dollars until they're either renounced, like I talked about, they sign with another team or they sign a new contract, in which case that amount takes over. The only full bird rights players that this does not apply to are players coming off their four year rookie contract as a first round pick. Now those players would count as 250% if they are above the average salary, which is usually only like the top few picks, like the top three picks sometimes get up to that amount above the average salary. But in most case, all the rest of the first round picks would be below the average salary. And those are actually going to count as a 300% cap hold. So for example, if a player was making $4 million this past season, and they were a rookie scale free agent, they would actually have a cap hold of 12 million. Early bird free agents will just count as 130% of their previous year's contract towards the cap. And then non-bird free agents count as 120% of last year's contract towards the cap as a cap hold as well. One exception to this is first round picks that do not have their third or fourth year options picked up are restricted to being assigned to whatever that contract was going to be by the team that owns the rights to do so. So for example, the Indiana Pacers traded for Jalen Smith, who did not have his third year contract picked up by the Phoenix Suns. Now he was supposed to make 4.67 million approximately next year. And that contract now becomes the maximum that the Indiana Pacers can offer him in free agency. So the cap hold would just be that amount because they can't offer many more than that. So it doesn't make sense to have the cap hold be any other number. But for any other team, they could come in and sign him for any amount that they have available to do so. But the Indiana Pacers specifically can only sign him for that $4.67 million. Now in the offseason, it'll be a strategy for each team to try and figure out how they want to manage these cap holds and what they do with them. So one team might have a bunch of lower cap holds, but could possibly have some cap space without re-signing those players for new amounts that are going to be much higher than those cap holds. So if they have a lot of players coming off a rookie scale, for example, the Portland Trailblazers in 2016, actually a lot of teams in 2016 had this problem and it got a lot of teams in trouble because... They had such low cap holds and the cap jumped by so much that they were able to hold off on re-signing their own free agents and then they had cap space to sign in the Blazers example and Evan Turner and Festus Azili and then they go and re-sign their own players since they had a low cap hold then they signed them for so much like an Alan Crabb a Mo Harkless and Myers Leonard that summer and then they go way over the cap to do that but they had cap space while the holds were so low. And then you also have the opposite situation where you could have a lot of players that are not going to make anywhere near what their cap hold is because it's close to a maximum or 20 million or whatever, and they're only going to sign for 10 million. So in that case, it might be smarter for a team to sign those players as quickly as possible and not have them wait. If a player has a ten, $20 million cap hold and they only sign for 10 million, depending on how close you are to the salary cap, that might be the difference between having enough salary to, to sign someone or not having enough salary to, to do so. So like the order of how they're signed and everything is really important in cases where they're trying to get cap space or have a chance to get cap space. Now, if you're a team operating over the cap, it really doesn't matter because you don't have a way to get cap space either. And I would include any team that's kind of just slightly below the cap as well. And here's why. If you had a trade exception like we talked about earlier, like let's just say you were $10 million under the cap and you had a $20 million trade exception, it wouldn't make sense to renounce that $20 million trade exception to sign someone with for $10 million. The mid-level exception that you would also have in that case is about $10 million. So you could keep your trade exception 
and just sign that player to the mid-level exception instead of using cap space. And then you get to keep all your other rights to any other free agents you have, all your other cap holds remain. But if you wanted to use, let's say you were trying to make like $15 million in cap space in that, then you'd have to renounce a bunch of free agents or cap holds or trade exceptions to get down to that amount to do so. So that's why it's hardly ever a case where a team has less than the mid-level exception in cap space because, like I said, the mid-level exception counts as a cap hold against your cap. So why not just use that to sign a free agent instead of using that cap space and then being restricted with what you can do because you're operating as a team under the cap. Another misconception that people have is that there's a difference between the salary cap number and the luxury tax number. So the luxury tax is simply the amount that you have to pay tax if you're over that number. It's not a case where you have the difference in the amount of the salary cap up to the luxury tax in cap space if the owner just chooses to pay for it. That's not how it works. It's just a little bit of a buffer zone to sign players, but it's you have to use exceptions, whether it be these cap holds or your mid-level exception or whatever. You can't just use that difference between the salary cap level and the luxury tax level as cap space. Well, that's cap holds. Uh, I hope you learned something. And if you have any questions or if you have any ideas for future salary cap videos that you would love to learn more about, go ahead and leave them in the comments below. Uh, if you also would like this video and if you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, it really helps us out a lot. Appreciate it. And I hope everyone has a great day. Thank you for watching.